Hello everybody and welcome to the Tuesday edition of Video Clips and first of all um, I'll deal with a couple of questions that were posted on the on the comment section. Sometimes I don't really want to type a whole big long answer out and for a couple of reasons. Number one it takes a lot of time and the second thing I'm a terrible typist so I have to proofread everything 20 times. So anyway the first one was um, a person wrote and said uh, I'm eating a vegan diet and I've lost weight and a lot of things are going well except my blood pressure won't come down. Is there anything that you can think of that I could do to lower my blood pressure that I might not be thinking about? And here is something that a lot of people overlook and that is the importance of hydration, drinking enough water every day. And I think it's a myth uh, that has been perpetuated in the plant-based community that if you're eating a lot of plant food, you don't have to drink water, but you actually really do have to drink water, about 64 ounces of water a day. And the reason is, it, we, we actually know, we have some science for this, that the average person loses about 10 cups of water a day and how you lose it is urine and feces, the obvious thing. Sweating, and believe it or not, I'm sweating here even though there's like water running down my face. We all sweat in an imperceptible way all day long. And then talking, and for me, talking is an Olympic event, so I lose a lot of water from talking. But if you go outside when it's really cold outside and you see the condensation when you're talking, that's, that's an example of losing water from talking. So that 10 cups has to be replaced, and it's pretty easy to get a couple of cups from uh, fruits and vegetables. I mean, if you ate a whole watermelon for lunch, you probably would get enough water maybe for half the day, but most of us are eating things like cauliflower and legumes and rice and things of that nature. So the other eight cups has to come from somewhere. Now, why is this so important when it comes to high blood pressure, hypertension, heart attack risk, and that sort of thing? It's because 60 to 70 percent of your blood plasma is water. And when you don't drink enough water, that blood plasma shrinks down and the blood becomes kind of sticky and viscous. Well, you can't have open spaces in your arteries, so the blood vessels start to shrink down too. So you've got thick, sludgy blood moving through narrowed arteries, and this increases your risk of a heart attack. And um, one group in Scandinavia did a really detailed research project on this and concluded a couple of things I thought were interesting. One is the less water you drink, the higher your risk of a heart attack or stroke. The second thing is the risk goes up when you replace a beverage for water. So if you decide you're going to drink orange juice instead of water or a soft drink instead of water or iced tea instead of water, your risk goes up. And the third thing that they said, which I thought was really interesting, is that the reason this group says there are more heart attacks in the morning is not because people are stressed about going to work, it's because it is the most dehydrated part of most people's day. Like they go to bed dehydrated, they get up in the morning, they're more dehydrated. So it's really, really important to drink water. So if you're a person who does have high blood pressure or you don't, either way, um, start drinking more water. And I have mine right here. I'm sipping water all day long until I get my 64 ounces in. More if I'm going into the hot yoga room and more when I'm working in the yard in the summertime because you have to replace the additional uh, lost water. Um, another question that I got a couple times, I get this regularly, so it's a good I idea to talk about it right now, is people will say, um, I'm starting down this path of losing weight and changing my diet and all that sort of thing, so am I going to be able to get off my medications? Or another version of that question is, I've gotten off a couple, I've managed to get off a couple of medications, but um, I'm still being medicated for something, and I watch the documentaries, and everybody gets to stop taking their drugs, and is there something wrong with me? And Okay, so here's how I answer that question. I think the first thing is to understand that nobody reputable is going to give you a guarantee and say, yes, if you change your diet and you exercise and lose weight, of course you're going to come off all of your meds. That's not, nobody reputable would say that. But here's what we can say. If you change your diet, you exercise, you really become physically active, you lose weight, you do a lot of right things in terms of taking care of yourself, your health is going to improve. What we don't know is how much your health is going to improve, how much medication you're going to be able to withdraw from. But look at it this way. Some of you know I teach by analogy. So let's say that you came into my office today and you're sitting across the desk from me here and I have a huge gash on my arm and it's bleeding and the blood is dripping on the floor and I keep picking at it. And, and I mentioned a couple of times to you, I don't know why this won't stop bleeding. And at some point in time you might say, you know Pam, I think if you stop picking at that sore, it might stop bleeding. And then my next question might be, well, how fast will it stop bleeding? How fast do you think it'll become infected? Do you think I'll have a scar? How big will the scar be? And, and you would say to me, 
I don't know about any of that, but here's what I do know. If you stop picking at that sore, it's going to get better. And so when you start taking the bad foods out of your diet, the high fat, the junk food, the too much animal food, and all the stuff that you hear me talking about uh, on this channel and in our programs, it's the equivalent of stop picking at the sore. Now, the rest of what's going to happen, we can't predict, but we do know this. You will get better if you do those things, all right? So you can see why I didn't want to type all of that out, right? Okay, a couple of announcements. If you live within driving distance of the Columbus area, you want to come to our self-care retreat on Saturday, April 13th. It's from 10 to 2. Um, Nurse Mary Marshall, a colleague of mine, she's fabulous. If you haven't taken classes from her, you really want to. She's going to be leading an interactive retreat on successful habit change and self-care. It includes reflexology and Reiki and um, good food, wonderful lunch and spa treatments and all that sort of thing. So lunch is included. So, so if you want to come, just call the office. It's $40 for, not, for non-members and or $30 for members, non-members are $40. And um, you really will enjoy yourself here. And you'll get to see our place. And I'll be here for, for part of it because I like the spa treatments too. All right. Um, and then the other thing, remember in June, this starts the Diet and Lifestyle course. Then this summer, we have the celebrity instructors like Dr. Goldhammer, Dr. Ralph Moss, Dr. Barnard, Dr. Esselstyn, uh, all the stars in my field, um, Dr. Peter Bregan. So this is a great opportunity to learn from, how would you like to be on the phone doing questions and answers with Dr. Neil Barnard? That's like as good as it gets. So uh, Pam Popper at msn.com if you want information about any of the stuff that we do here from the spa retreat to uh, spa and health self-care retreat to uh, the diet and lifestyle course this summer. All right, um, now here we go into news. According to a report in the Journal of the American Medical Association, the FDA drug companies and doctors, this will shock you, were extremely negligent in the way they handled the prescribing of fentanyl, which by now I'm sure you've seen in the news, it's a potentially powerful, powerful and potentially deadly drug. The researchers obtained and reviewed almost 5,000 pages of documents from the government which they got through the Freedom of Information Act. The documents showed that all of the parties prior to the prescribing of fentanyl had, set a had developed a set of ground rules um, to prescribe and monitor fentanyl, but the, the rules were disregarded and the drug was widely prescribed to people who did not qualify to get it. Even worse, the FDA was aware that the rules were being broken and didn't do anything about it. Um, they rarely do anything about anything that would involve disciplining drug companies and, and even medical professionals. Uh, I'm going to be talking about that on Thursday of this week, too. The Risk Evaluation and Mitigation Strategy Supervision Program was developed in 2011, and it required the manufacturers of fentanyl to educate prescribers, pharmacists, and patients and doctors about the correct use of fentanyl when used in the form of oral sprays and lozenges. The drugs were supposed to be prescribed to cancer patients who had become tolerant, had developed a tolerance to opiate medications and needed immediate pain relief. Regular reports were supposed to be made to the FDA. Well, as it turned out, about half of the patients who were given these drugs did not qualify. They were not resistant to, um, uh, they had not developed opiate tolerance, and a great deal of them were not cancer patients. They had conditions like uh, migraines and back pain, and, and those conditions really don't warrant a prescription of fentanyl. According to the report, the FDA took no action against the drug companies, the pharmacists, or the doctors. This in spite of, quote, increasing evidence that the program was not achieving its stated goals, which were to protect patient safety. FDA officials defended this whole lack of oversight by stating that doctors can prescribe any medication they choose to. In other words, regardless of any rules or guidelines established by the FDA, doctors can do almost anything they want to without interference, so a reasonable person might question why the agency bothers to develop any rules or guidelines at all. And this is a, becoming a more and more common thing where the FDA says, listen, once we approve a drug or a device or anything like that, um, doctors can do whatever they want to, so we really don't have any ability to stop some of these things from going on. And I just find that difficult to understand. What makes these events especially egregious is that all of this took place long after it became widely known that the opiate drugs had been abused and that we had um, an epidemic of opiate abuse and addiction and even deaths. I, I heard um, uh, lately the figures up to 200,000 people now have died of opiate overdoses and, and related uh, situations. Now this is not the only area concerning opiates in which the FDA completely abdicated, in my opinion, its oversight authority. 
According to another analysis published also in the Journal of the American Medical Association, companies making opiate drugs spent enormous amounts of money courting doctors and convincing them to prescribe the drugs. Drug reps assured docs that the drugs were not addictive, which was uh, not true, patently false claim in terms of that. Almost 68,000 doctors were the recipients of $40 million between 2013 and 2015, which was spent on meals, travel, gifts, and consulting fees. By the way, consulting fees in this particular situation means paying doctors to do conference calls for drug reps to educate them about the use of the drugs so that they'll give accurate information to other doctors. And I'm trying not to laugh out loud here because this is just ridiculous. But in any case, the analysis in the, in the Journal of the American Medical Association showed a direct link to the amount of money invested and in outcomes. In the counties in which more money was spent, the death rate from opiate overdose increased. They were even able to quantify the effect for every three additional payments of any type to doctors, meals or whatever they were giving them. Per 100,000 population, there were 18% more overdoses per year. So in other words, what we have going on here is the drug companies make a very calculated investment. Um, they expect to make a return on investment. They're not stupid people. They're, in, they're unscrupulous people, but they're certainly not stupid. So they make an investment, they expect to get a return, and they do in terms of, of additional prescriptions written. But the, the collateral damage is deaths from overdose, which really doesn't bother them at all. So what we really have here is a complete and total disregard for public health and specifically for human life and well-being. You know, the, the FDA, I, I can't imagine what these people are thinking. I don't know if you've ever seen the FDA building in Washington, D.C., but it's, it's about a city block long, several stories high. There must be tens of thousands of people in there. I don't know what they're doing all day long, but they're sure not paying attention to this. Um, the drug companies then have free reign to just do whatever they want to, promote whatever they want to. And doctors regularly engage in what I think is irresponsible behavior by prescribing tests, drugs, and procedures um, without checking things out on their own. And by the way, if you question that that goes on at all, uh, please plan to be at our conference this fall. Chris McGreal will be speaking. He's the author of American Overdose, and among many things that he'll be talking about, he will tell the story of how uh, Purdue Pharma's drug reps basically told doctors that opiates weren't addictive. They referred to a two-paragraph letter to the editor uh, that, had, that, that was not a study, it wasn't reporting the results of a study, it was an observation made by a doctor and his associate in New England that uh, patients, when given uh, opiate drugs in the hospital, didn't become addicted. Um, doctors bought that story, they never bothered to look up the, uh, the it was referred to as a study, Porter and Jick. It wasn't a study, it was a two-paragraph letter to the editor. On the basis of that, doctors started prescribing the drugs, and here we are. If anybody who had, if anybody had gone back and read Porter and Jick, you can look this up online, by the way, and read it yourself. See what you think about it, and if it's a compelling case for prescribing opiates in an outpatient setting. Completely insane. You know, so I guess I always conclude my comments these days by saying, you're the consumer, you better beware. You better be educated so that these types of terrible things don't happen to you. All right, as usual, hit that subscribe button. Pass this on to anybody who you think would enjoy watching it, and I'll be back to you on Thursday with more news.